So everybody can hear me? Yes? Raise your hand if you cannot. Um, as I was saying just before, uh, this course is supposed to reach even uh, non-experts, uh, even those without natural science background. But uh, obviously, uh, sometimes things go faster and then you might feel left behind. The best way is to just ask uh, questions. How many of you uh, heard of climate and weather before? How many of you know what is the difference between weather and climate? What is the difference between weather and climate? Yes, and? Right, so there is some vague definition of climate. It's some kind of an average weather. That's how you can think of it. So we'll, as we go forward, we'll see that there is no uh, uh, rigorous way to define climate other than to say it's some kind of a long-term average, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it really depends on what problem you are looking at. So if you define it as 30 years and then the background state changes, background state means the climate on which the weather happens, right? So the best way to think is today is uh, uh, July 1st. So if you think about July 1st and December 1st, which uh, day you would expect to be warmer? July 1st? Hmm? July 1st. So you expect that December 1st will be colder than July 1st. That's basically climate. You expect it. But because of some sunny day, cloudy day, it may turn out that July 1st is actually cooler than December 1st. That would be weather. So climate is kind of what you expect and weather is what you get. Right? So the way we define climate and climatology is that if you have a long time series, let's say this is the daily temperature from some region, it's very warm, the range is fairly large, so you can think of it as a place where the daily time scale temperature changes by a lot. So you take each January 1 for 10, 20, 30 years and you average them and you say that is the climatology of January 1 temperature, right? Or you can make it kind of a smoother one. Here it is showing uh, the same thing. And it is averaging now, not plotting every day. It's averaged the, uh, the temperatures over, uh, uh, let's say, every week for the whole year. And now you can see more clearly that uh, there are two peaks in temperature. So there is a warm day. You can think of this as pre-monsoon. During the monsoon, generally India cools. It's almost like our winter. And then you have, after the monsoon ends, you get again some sunny days before the northeast winds come and temperatures cool down. So you have two peaks. So these are the kind of things you look for. And when you think about climate change, you try to see if you took the average of uh, temperature, uh, let's say you averaged over the whole year and say the annual mean temperature is something. And then you take uh, temperatures over long periods. This is going from 1882 to 2014. And it's showing uh, Chennai, Mumbai, Delhi, and so on. And you can see that the average temperature uh, of the year has gone from 28 to about 28.8 degrees centigrade. You can do statistical analysis and show that whether these are significant or not significant, and so on. And you would generally tend to call this climate change, but even that definition is not very rigorous because if you took temperature for 200 years or 400 years, it might turn out, turn out that temperature goes up and comes back down and goes back up again. Right? But this period is special because we know that industrial revolution happened and we started burning a lot of fossil fuels. So we have changed the radiative balance. In other words, everybody has heard of the term greenhouse effect. We'll come back to that. So we have changed essentially the amount of energy that can escape from the planet. So we'll look at that. So that, in that sense, we are feeling a bit more confident to say that this is uh, actual trend, not a change, not a cycle, right? So we will see what are the time scales over which climate actually changes and what are the processes. The main thing to learn is that when you go to very long time scales like 
the formation of Earth, etc. Things have happened that have naturally changed the climate and on various time scales. And there is various evidences we can collect to say how and why those, how much and why those changes happened. Because we want to understand how this is changing, how fast this is changing, how sensitive Earth's climate is to the changes we make to the energy balance. Right? Why do we need that? Basically because we want to understand where we are going, what the future is about to bring. So it's looking back in time tells you how sensitive our climate is to some of the changes we make. Okay? So that's, yeah. Yeah, so we will we'll see that because you are basically saying there is dynamics which can move around energy. Typically, we talk about Chennai temperature means, <coughs> sorry, we have averaged over Chennai, right? So does that mean every part of Chennai is warm? When you look at such a small scale, it's very likely. But if you think about all of India or all of the world, then obviously that doesn't have to be. Right? So that goes back to what is called scale selection, which we have to understand from the basic perspective. Where are the winds going? Why are they going where they are going? Where it is raining and where it is not raining? And how those places change with any change you make in the energy balance? So it's not just a question of will it warm everywhere, but the question of where will it warm and where will it not warm? And how fast will it warm? in some place versus other place and so on. So it's always about how the system is choosing the scales internally given the forcing. Sorry? This is showing annual mean temperatures going from, whenever you see these total temperatures, we'll begin to see something called anomalies soon enough. So you see that this is showing some spikes and some dips. So that means from year to year, the temperature is not constant. Some years are warmer than other years. And the point we are trying to make is that over time, the mean temperature has gone up. Well, this is, this is showing time, hence it's not a temporal average, but it's not showing every day, so it is averaged each year, and it is averaged over Chennai. It's, well, when it says Chennai, it's prob I mean, those kinds of details are not necessary at this point for the point I'm trying to make. If IMD has had some measurement over Chennai, right, it is saying that corresponds to Chennai temperature. Doesn't mean every meter of Chennai was measuring temperature. So it is some, let's say there were two stations or three stations. This is just the average of those. Obviously, number of stations would have been more here than here and so on. Those are not necessary at this point. What will become necessary later on is that temperature has, generally temperature, for example, if we are in some village here, I don't know the name, uh, and IISC is over there, it's very likely that temperature over here and IISC will be very similar or almost the same, but it could be raining over here but not over there. So temperature has a very different decorrelation scale than precipitation. Those kinds of things are important. Those kind of details, it's not necessary right now. Okay. So how, uh, what, do you, what is the context then? So I will throw this up right now. We'll come back and see later on. This is going back to the time of the dinosaurs when the meteorite crash happened and so on. And now we are not looking at total temperatures. We are looking at now polar ocean temperature change. So if you measured some temperature or the Arctic, for example, if you went back 65 million years ago, it was, this is a deviation from, when you say uh, temperature change, it is obviously with re reference to something. This is typically what we will end up doing. When we say global warming, 
we will be comparing it to some other time period over which temperature was not as warm as today. So the same thing is being done here. This is, let's say, compared to average of 1960 to 1990 temperature. And you can see that the temperatures over the Arctic were 12 degrees warmer than the present when the dinosaurs were alive. Okay? And there was a very huge spike uh, called Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. The details are not necessary, but essentially it says that there are triggers in the system which can cause very rapid warming of several degrees, right? So we are talking about a change of about uh, 0.8 degree or 1 degree uh, here over 100 years. And we are talking about, sorry, <laughs> temperatures that were 12 degrees warmer than uh, the present day. So what are the processes that could cause this much warming and sudden spikes. So you want to understand how fast this changed, of course, and what caused it, and what is that warming rate relative to what is happening now. It turns out that even though this looks very spiky here, it is actually not as fast as the global warming we are doing here. But when you look at this, you cannot even see the global warming here. That's the kind of context you want to have, that we have been much warmer before, there have been very rapid warmings, but let's say over the last 50 million years, the temperature has generally cooled compared to the time of the dinosaurs. So the system has all kinds of information in the past that can tell you a lot of things. There are a lot of details we'll keep coming back to. So the warming that's happening here, this is the current and this is going back in time. That's typically how paleoclimate people do things. Everybody understands what paleoclimate means, right? It's just past climate. And obviously, there was nobody measuring temperatures. So we use what are called proxies, geochemical information to extract past climates, which typically means you cannot get absolute temperatures, but you can get relative changes using isotopes like oxygen 18, which we'll come back to in the next chapter. Okay, so lots of information here, but just try to get a grasp of what we are trying to do. Okay, so you have to put this warming in the context of these sorts of things. And if your grandmother asks if temperature was 12 degrees warmer before, why are you worrying about one or two degrees C warming now? What would be your answer? Are we worrying for no reason? where we are heading, okay. Okay, what else? We are going in the right direction, but grandma will not be impressed. <laughs> Basically, there were no human beings before about three, four million years ago. And a modern human being has essentially evolved in the last 10 to 12,000 years where Temperature changes have been very minor. They have been order half a degree or so. So it is sensitivity, but as well as, in other words, global warming is not a problem for the planet or biology, right? It's only problem for us. It could be a problem for us, right? So that is something to remember, that planet is not going anywhere and microbes have survived for billions of years. They are not going anywhere, but we haven't been around that much. Uh, so... This is now putting that, uh, taking this previous time series and focusing much more closely on the last few hundred thousand years. Again, this, is, this comes from a paleo proxy from uh, ice cores. We will briefly uh, look at that. Now, this is showing uh, just the last 400,000 years, and there is a kind of a nonlinear scale here. And this is showing that CO2 or carbon dioxide has changed over some time scale, which is around 100,000 years. We will see, again, it's always the selection of spatial scale and temporal scale, which we always have to focus on. So we'll try to see where this 100,000 year comes from. And there is methane, which seems to vary pretty much the similar way as uh, carbon dioxide. And here is the temperature change that also looks 
that is similar to uh, carbon dioxide. There's a slight lead lag here. Temperature actually leads by about 30,000 years. Uh, and what is interesting also is when you look at the time period since Industrial Revolution, CO2 and methane have increased faster than anything we have seen here. Okay, we are above any limit in the, now it's almost to the last several million years uh, that we are above the levels of CO2 we have seen for several million years. Methane, again, also much higher than anything we have seen. The other thing for those who are not familiar with these numbers is to remember that CO2 is typically mentioned as parts per uh, million in volume, whereas methane is parts per billion. Okay, the scales are very different. These are called trace gases, which means if you look at nitrogen, uh, argon, oxygen, and so on, they are the dominant gases, but these are in such small quantities that they are called trace gases, and yet they are the most important for energy balance, and we'll see why that is. But the point I want to make here is that in the past, temperatures have changed, and then methane and CO2 have responded, whereas here, methane and CO2 have uh, respo uh, already changed, but temperature has not changed as much yet. Okay? Can anybody quickly guess why that is? I'm, I mean, I won't blame you if you cannot. Essentially, that means the, the process by which temperature was changing and then CO2 and methane were responding was different in the past than in the present. Before, we will see that something in the way energy uh, distribution and energy amount received by the Earth changed, basically because the Earth's orbit changed and the temperature responded first so if you if the tilt changed ellipticity of the orbit changed or the precession changed the amount of energy being received would change so temperature would respond first and then that would somehow change the amount of uh, ice cover or vegetation or some other thing in the ocean and so on and it would change carbon dioxide and methane and then the three would almost go together for some time, and then there will be another orbital change and so on. Whereas at present, we are burning fossil fuels and we are increasing when we are doing agriculture, dams and so on, which change methane. So we are changing carbon dioxide and uh, methane first, and then temperature is trying to respond. Okay, so we'll see why this kind of lag happens. The other very important thing you will notice here, I'm just throwing these basic concepts, we'll keep coming back to them again and again, so they will get reinforced. Don't worry about um, uh, details if you don't get it, but if there's a critical question, you should ask. You will see that this is a very slow time scale process here, and something happens very quickly, and again, slow process happens quickly and so on, right? Why is that important? Basically because there is some sort of an asymmetry here. You are cooling temperatures here, you are warming here. Remember, time is going this way. You are cooling temperatures here, warming here. So somehow, the cooling process is slower than the warming process. Why? Anybody heard of this before? Okay, so I will just mention it now, but we'll again come, come back to it again and again. So when you're cooling, air temperature is getting colder and colder, right? So what happens to humidity in the air if air temperature is getting colder? Will there be more humidity or less humidity? Less, right? So somehow when energy is reduced and temperature begins to cool, you begin to increase snowfall and build glaciers. How many of you know what glacier means? Okay, what is a glacier? Okay, so we, we say glacier and not ice for that reason. Ice is when you freeze the water. Glacier is essentially when you snow and the snow doesn't melt, more snow falls on top and it gets compressed and becomes frozen. And that behaves very differently than ice, structurally and 
in terms of properties. Glacier is like molasses, it can flow. Ice is very rigid, it's structurally arranged in a different way, as you know from your basics from third standard or whatever. So glacier, which means can you build glacier on the ocean? It's very hard. You can freeze the ocean and build sea ice, but only on land you can build glaciers, right? So as whatever happens to change the energy received, if planet begins to cool, air temperature cools down, you have less humidity, which means there cannot be as much snow. Let's say you're building glacier on Greenland and Antarctica. As temperatures begin to cool, the snowfall rate begins to decrease because there is just less humidity, right? So as you begin to cool, the amount of snowfall begins to decrease and building glaciers become harder and harder. We will see there is another process. Is snow and ice brighter than land or less bright? Brighter, which means it can reflect more of the sun's energy coming in. So you're also losing more energy, right? So for whatever reason, the energy uh, reduction and cooling ends and warming starts. So now you are going the other way. You are beginning to melt the glaciers, which means you are reducing the reflectivity of the snow and ice, right? Which means you will keep more of the sun's energy in the system and the glacier will melt faster and faster, right? So this will go very fast. Building glaciers takes a long time, 100,000 years. This happens much more rapidly, very slow building and so on. This is critical now because where are we? Are we here or are we on this side? Right? We are in the warming phase. So we have to be very careful because if suddenly already Antarctica, some parts are melting, we'll see why Antarctica is not melting uniformly. Arctic is different, it's sea ice, it's also melting, but Greenland is glacier, which is melting faster and faster. So is there a way we will kick the system to go boom and just melt the whole thing? And what would that mean? Of course, it would mean enormous amount of water that's moved from the ocean onto land as glacier will be released and sea levels will go up everywhere. For example, Bangladesh, which is sitting there quietly on the sea level, where will they go? all into Assam and West Bengal, right? And we know how friendly we are when outsiders come. So those are the kinds of things we have to worry about. So these are the basic processes. So this is called ice albedo feedback. Ice changes, albedo changes, and there is a positive feedback. So there is a positive feedback in this direction also. Why is it negative? Is, is cooling, is increasing the glacier or not? <laughs> so both are positive, but they are asymmetric. We will see later on how we define feedback. That's a very interesting thing. It, we always say feedback, but you can have multiple branches. You can have negative and positive feedbacks. But if all the negative feedbacks multiply into an even number, then you'll, the whole network will be still positive feedback. Okay, we can use a simple example to explain that. So in this case, cooling is slowing down, snowfall is decreasing. So if you just think about feedback between cooling temperature and snowfall, they are still going in the temperature is decreasing, snowfall is decreasing. So that's a positive feedback. Temperature is decreasing, snowfall is decreasing, but glaciers are growing. So you can think of it as a negative feedback, but overall, it is still a positive feedback where you have two negative feedbacks, okay? This is also a positive feedback where temperature warming, albedo is decreasing, glaciers are decreasing, but temperature continues to warm. Two negatives, so you have to be careful. Anyway, ice albedo feedback is one of the most critical feedbacks in the system and it's still operating uh, today over uh, uh, Arctic, Greenland and uh, uh, Antarctica. We'll see that Antarctica is supremely complicated because of the configuration of ocean and land and so on. Yes. 
No, why should I? <laughs> yeah, so as I briefly mentioned, the temperature changes before us has mostly happened because of in this period, it has mostly happened because of changes in the orbit, which we will look at. But if you go back to the other longer time period, you could have had changes that are not orbitally forced, but because continents are moving. So you have to always track what are the processes that are starting the change and what are the feedbacks that are uh, happening to make it grow or cool down. For example, I casually mentioned that temperatures have been cooling over the last 50 million years. So overall they have cooled, but there are spikes, which means there is one process and then there are multiple processes happening. And it turns out that Indians are directly responsible for this 50 million year cooling, especially Tamilians. <laughs> Just joking. It, we'll see that the Himalayas that got formed over this period actually may have contributed quite a bit to reducing the CO2 in the system over this long time scale. Remember, if it's 12 degrees C warmer, that means the carbon dioxide was likely much, much higher than today, right? So to cool this much, you would have to take, have taken out a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Who can do that? Only Indians, right? Any other? What is your name? Sana. Did you pay tuition for this course? No? Then why are you asking so many questions? <laughs> CO2, yes. So, yes, if you build ice, you will on land. What will happen to vegetation? Right? or you'll put more sea ice on the ocean to remove, to prevent CO2 going out. So yes, there is a relation. The main thing to remember since you are uh, very particular about getting your money's worth even though you didn't pay anything, the, the range of change over ice age and no ice age is order 100 parts per, uh, sorry, let's go here. 80 to 100 parts per million of CO2. Okay, we have, we don't have a solid theory to explain all the change together. We, we typically use multiple processes to explain where this much change would come from, because it involves how much goes into the ocean, how much vegetation changes happen, or how the sea level changes and how that changes the production in the ocean. Production means primary production or photosynthesis. But basic idea is that uh, deglacial to glacial time change is order 100 ppm. But there is a relation between temperature and CO2. Okay, so let's take a quick look at uh, what basic climate uh, and weather really is. I think everybody has a sense of it. Uh, but just to explain again, uh, Earth is a sphere. And if it was not tilted and was just going around the sun, then there would be no seasons. Each latitude would re, uh, receive the same amount of energy all year as it rotates. But once you tilt it, you have one pole facing the sun, other pole away from the sun. So you have seasons happening. But without that, you can still think about energy balance essentially as the amount of solar radiation coming in is far enough away that it's basically parallel to Earth when they approach the top of the atmosphere, right? So the area uh, exposed to the sun rays is higher or the amount of energy received per unit area is larger in the lower latitudes than the higher latitudes where there is a curvature, right? Is that clear? I'm not, I will show equations, but intuitively you should get a sense that if you take a, a basketball or something, and you shine a light on it, it will be brighter in the center than at the top because of the curvature. So that is the energy coming in is in certain frequencies 
which we call short wave, right? Most of the energy reaching the sun's energy is a full electromagnetic spectrum going from gamma rays and infrared to visible uh, microwave, radio wave, etc. But what reaches the earth is mostly in the visible, right? So that is the short wave energy coming in. The energy coming in then heats everything or evaporates whatever. And just like our body emits heat, there is heat coming from the earth, right? That is in the so-called infrared or we call it long wave radiation or outgoing long wave radiation. So you have short wave energy coming in and there is outgoing long wave radiation and this balance is what determines what the average temperature is. And the main thing on, on Earth or other planets is this is affected by certain gases, right? Which are the gases? Hmm? What? What are the gases? Well, we've already we already seen two, methane and CO2, CH4, and we have others like N2O, and we have also added CFCs, HFCs, and ozone, and so on, right? So, for grandma, this will be impressive. You tell her, grandma, there is short wave coming in and out, out wave, uh, long wave going out, and you show her her body is emitting temperature, she'll be shocked because all her life she didn't know that. Right? So, then once you do that, you have try you're trying to lose energy and you're receiving energy. So, you're receiving more and less here, plus you are going to add snow and ice here. Which means, the short wave that's coming in is reflected directly by some things which have reflectivity that is higher or lower depending on whether it's desert or city land or agriculture or forest or ice and snow. So essentially you end up losing more energy than receiving here and receiving more energy than you are losing to space here. So if you don't move energy around, this will keep getting warmer and warmer and that will keep getting whoops, colder and colder. And that is why you have winds and ocean currents trying to move energy constantly from the lower latitudes to higher latitudes, right? And once you put winds, winds can go over the Himalayan mountains and Rocky Mountains and so on, they can go around. But the ocean, which is being dragged by the winds and heated and cooled by the atmosphere, cannot go over land. So it has to decide what to do when it gets pushed this way or this way. Right? We'll see some details of how that works. Those are the basic physics of ocean and atmosphere we have to understand, to understand the changes and so on. And the other thing that's happening is because the Earth is rotating around its axis, it's like you are on a merry-go-round. If you stand on a merry-go-round and try to be like Salman Khan, you're going to fall because you are not Salman Khan. What is that thing called? Coriolis effect. How many of you never heard of Coriolis effect? Huh? Astronomer obviously you heard of it. Don't be shy. Who has never heard of it? Okay. We'll see what it is. If I give a quiz on Coriolis right now, everybody will pass? <laughs> Maybe. So that's essentially what's happening. So that's short wave. You can see it. This is warm, but you cannot see it. But if you go close, you can feel it, right? So it's emitting black body radiation, which is more technical term than the long wave radiation. So infrared also is the same thing. If we want to quickly do some uh, calculations. There is the solar flux coming in. At the top of the atmosphere, it's some number. Uh, if you just think about what area of the Earth is intercepting the energy coming in, then that will be a circle. So the energy coming in is essentially just area of the circle, which is radius of the Earth squared, and then that's the flux, the per unit area of uh, what solar energy is coming in. Okay? 
you're not writing anything and you're looking kind of scared. So, so that's the amount of energy that's uh, coming in. But obviously not all of it is being used because there is what is called the albedo, right? So albedo reflects alpha times the energy coming in. So what remains is just one minus alpha times that. So that is some number. You are getting the PDF files. Everybody is getting PDF, right? Yes? Hmm? You haven't got it? Did you pay for this? No. I think everybody will get PDF, right? You're distributing the PDFs? Yeah. So you will get the notes. Uh, you can look at it. Plus, I think they will release the tapes at some point. Um, they, are, they are video recording. That's why I'm wearing this. OK, so that's the net solar energy coming in. So what are we doing here? We are just balancing things at a planetary level. We are just saying we won't worry about each square meter. We'll just look at how much total energy is coming in, which is basically going to depend on the area that is inter Even though it's rotating and doing all that, we are forgetting about the tilt for now. We are just making it stand and looking at how much energy is being received. You have a question? No? Okay. Is this clear? Just. It is called albedo. Albedo is a reflectivity, how much of the solar energy is directly being reflected. So if I'm standing here, my head is reflecting some of that light. <laughs> that is, snow is brighter than, let's say, the ocean or land. So they are directly sending some energy back to space. Okay, the average albedo of the Earth is about 0.3. Okay, the question is, did it change a lot in the past? Will it change in the future? What the clouds are doing? Because it depends on how much cloud there is, how much ice there is, how much uh, glaciers there are, and so on and so forth. But we are de ignoring those details and doing just planetary level energy balance. So everything that is getting... Oh, wow. Yeah, it can be as high as 0.9, more than 0.9 for uh, snow, fresh snow. And it can be as low as 0.2. For if you are flying on an aircraft and you look down at the ocean, if the sun is at an angle, you might be getting lost, strong glint. But if sun is on top, the ocean may look dark, right? So ocean's albedo can go from 0.2 to 0.8, for example. Desert will be brighter. Forest will be darker. So it's anywhere from 0.1 to 0.9598, whatever. Okay? But the average is around 0.3. Okay? So everything, everything that is emitting OLR is basically doing by the black body radiation, which is the constant, Stefan Boltzmann constant, times some effective temperature to the fourth. Right? And this is going out from each square meter of the Earth. And all of the surface area of the Earth is emitting this. Right? Which means the outgoing energy is the surface area of the sphere times the emitted energy per unit area. So you have to balance the incoming shortwave energy to the outgoing long wave energy to get the mean emission emissivity temperature of the Earth, which is just this uh, simple expression. If you put the numbers in it for sigma and solar flux, we know how much it is. We know albedo is about 0.3, and you get a number like this. Is this the right number for Earth's average temperature uh, that is emitting to space? No? Why? It's too cold or too warm? Why, why is that? Okay, so there's somebody from IISC. Are you from IISC? Where are you from? I said Pune. That's even better, isn't it? So essentially to find the m more reasonable temperature, we have to add the greenhouse gas, where now we are going to look at each square uh, uh, unit square on Earth and do the balance. So we have, now you have to, if you look at each square, you have to obviously divide by 4 pi a, uh, a squared because you're not doing 
just the energy intercepted by the whole uh, circle. So you have S0 or 4 coming in. This much is being reflected directly. And you have now added an atmosphere with some average temperature of Ta. Okay, so this energy that heats the surface is going to try to go out. That's the OLR from the surface. Let's call it S. This energy is going to heat the atmosphere. And that, so we are assuming that all the energy is being absorbed by the atmosphere, which is a simplifying assumption, but it doesn't matter. That atom is going to emit space at that temperature and also back down because outgoing long wave radiation is going to go in every direction. So some of it is coming back. So you have energy going to space, energy coming back. So the surface is now getting not only the short wave, but also some additional long wave from the atmosphere. Okay? So one thing you need to remember is as soon as you add a greenhouse gas, the surface temperature is going to get warmer because now you are adding some reflected or some OLR coming back. If you didn't have a greenhouse effect, this wouldn't be as warm. So you can easily, I don't know if I have that example here or not, but you can easily apply this to understand why Venus, Mars and Earth have such different temperatures, right? If you just look at the, the difference in the distance from the sun and do the 1 over r squared kind of flux calculation, the energy received from the sun cannot explain the difference of Venus temperature, which is what? Much higher is not an answer that grandma will be happy about. What is the number? 300 is very low. Average, average temperature, night and day. Earth has different night and day temperature. When you are rotating, there is one night, one day. Right? It's some 460 degrees centigrade. What is the temperature of Mars? Minus 50 degrees centigrade. So it's very cold, very hot. But Earth is a nice, it's called Goldilocks syndrome, where the blanket is neither too warm nor too cold. We have perfect blanket, right? So we have about 15 degrees centigrade average temperature. You, this cannot be explained just by the energy received, so it obviously has to do with the amount of energy you are trapping from the energy you are receiving from the sun. Anyway, so if you do these simple calculations and redo your uh, uh, amount of, so this is the energy that is being received by each, each unit area and you are ex, uh, emitting sigma Ta to the fourth. So you equate that, that is also equal to the energy going out, emission temperature. And you get the A here is what is going up, up or down. They are the same. We are assuming for simplicity there is no complications. Surface is emitting sigma Ts to the fourth. That is the surface temperature. I'm going fast because this is all in the notes and it's only for you to understand what we are trying to do, okay? So then the energy going up from the surface is the energy coming from the sun plus the energy coming from the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect that is coming from the atmosphere. But this is again equal to sigma Ta to the fourth. So you add that and essentially you get surface temperature is 2 sigma t to the fourth instead of the one we had before. Essentially, that means the temperature, surface temperature is now a multiplied quantity of the emission temperature. This is the key concept that greenhouse gas, greenhouse effect gives you a warmer surface temperature. So as you keep on increasing the the greenhouse gases and increase the greenhouse effect, you are essentially increasing the surface temperature. There are complications, of course, because from where this emission temperature is happening is not very simple. Atmosphere has a structure. There are many levels from which the energy is going to space because it depends on which gas is preventing it from going out, which clouds are preventing it, and so on and so forth. 
we'll see that that's a bit complicated. So you can think of it as greenhouse warming is more energy being trapped, or you can think of it as the OLR and shortwave being equilibrated at a different temperature. So if you increase, if you change this temperature, you will change this temperature. It's a bit complicated. The words are a bit complicated, but just remember that it all comes down to energy balance. And we are essentially changing the efficiency of the blanket that Earth has in terms of a greenhouse effect. So this now gives you 303 Kelvin, which is obviously way too warm because we assumed only one layer and so on. So essentially you have to do much more complicated calculations because atmosphere is a continuously stratified system. How many of you know what stratified means? How many of you heard this word before? Aisar Pune. Huh? You heard it? Where? Arnab Goswami. Huh? Cells must. What? <laughs> okay. So if you think this is uh, pressure going up in the atmosphere and this is temperature, we'll see that temperature looks something like this. So there are layers in the ocean and the atmosphere. Stratification is essentially layering. Okay, so obviously the calculation is quite a bit more complicated and that is a very hard task to do the energy balance of the planet. So if you look at the uh, radiation spectrum of the sun uh, and look at the sunlight that is coming at the top of the atmosphere, right? That looks like this in terms of its uh, distribution. But what gets to the surface depends on what gases are preventing it from getting it to the surface. So there are some gases which, can, which are able to affect the sun's radiation coming in and there are some gases which will affect the energy that is going out. So the spectrum of energy being emitted by Earth is very different than that because that is long wave and that is short wave. And you can see here that there are some gases like CO2 and H2O which have multiple bands of sensitivity to outgoing long wave radiation. So you can think of basically molecules CO2 and H2O are CO2 is symmetric, but H2O is not. They can allow photons of short wave to go through, but when the long wave photon comes, they are sensitive to it. So either their vibration, their bending and rotation can change, which means essentially their kinetic energy is changing, which means their temperature is changing. So they can trap the energy that's going out. This kind of details, uh, NASA has to worry about a lot because they, if you are sending a satellite up above the atmosphere and trying to look at the surface, if it is blocked by some greenhouse gas for the energy that is coming from the surface, let's say you are trying to measure ocean chlorophyll or surface temperature or something, then they need to look at the energy coming from the surface. But if it is being blocked by some gas, they cannot look at it. So they look at these so-called windows of opportunity where energy can escape all the way to the sky from the surface. That's where they make the measurements. So the frequencies being received by the satellites are very carefully picked to look at those frequencies where photons are coming all the way from the surface, right? So those kinds of details. Everything is buried in here. So there are people who spend their lifetime looking at the details of how this uh, energy happen, energy uh, exchange happens. So this is just showing various uh, temperatures and where the energy is going out. So again, you can see H2O, CO2, ozone. These are the dominant uh, greenhouse gases. There is a difference. We'll come back to it again and again. But what do you think is the difference between H2O and CO2, for example, in terms of their, let's say, their distribution or their impact on 
uh, energy balance or trapping outgoing long wave radiation. If water is one of the most dominant greenhouse gases, then why are you worried about CO2? That's the way to ask questions. Hmm? We said CO2 is a tracer gas. It's very low concentration compared to water, but we are still worried about CO2. We always talk about CO2 when it comes to greenhouse gas, never about water. Hmm? What? O3? No. Actually, I mean, unless you did this before, maybe you won't know, but you can think intuitively. Is the distribution of carbon dioxide and water vapor similar? Typically, when you look at CO2 concentrations, they will show one curve from Hawaii and say that is showing how Earth's CO2 is increasing. Can you do that for water? Can you measure it in ICTS and say that something about world's humidity? No. We talked about why glacier building gets slower and slower, and we said as air temperature cools, water vapor becomes less and less, exponential relation, right? So essentially, H2O is distributed very unevenly. In the tropics, it's very humid. As you go to higher latitude, it's bone dry, right? And it's not well mixed. Bengaluru is not as humid as Goa or Mumbai, right? So water vapor is a feedback gas. If temperature increases, humidity increases. If temperature decreases, humidity decreases. And it's not uniformly distributed. Whereas CO2, which is very non-reactive, gets easily mixed. So if you measure it in uh, Hawaii, it gives you a good estimate of CO2 over the whole northern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere, there is a little bit different because it's not easy to cross the equator and so on, which we'll look at later. CO2 is well mixed. It stays around in the atmosphere for tens to hundreds of years. Okay? So the main thing to remember is water vapor is a feedback gas. Okay? We'll see that ozone is a very strong greenhouse gas. But is ozone a bad thing? Is there a place where ozone is a good thing? Where? in the stratosphere. So you used stratosphere all your life, but you never thought of why it is called stratosphere. Why is it called stratosphere and not stratosphere? <laughs> because it is stratified, okay? So if it is in the stratosphere, in fact, it is preventing UV from coming to the surface and otherwise we'll all be dead. But if it's in the troposphere, how many of you heard the word troposphere before? Huh? You all have? You know all of them? <laughs> huh? Who knows? What's your name? Huh? Avantika from where? Huh? Varanasi. From the holy land of Varanasi, Avantika. How many of you know her? Nobody knows you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe in Varanasi. In Trichy, it's not taught at all. Okay, so this is the temperature I was drawing here. So energy is escaping from various places. So we also have to know how the atmospheric structure itself changes with global warming or climate change. Climate change is more refers to natural change and global warming is more about how we are affecting it and so on. Okay, so that's something we have to worry about. So let's look at some numbers then. So this is the per unit area energy coming in, 340 watts per meter squared, and you get rid of one third of it because of albedo, uh, about 100. So you have 240 coming in, and you can see that even though only 240 coming in, you have much bigger numbers happening here, 390. This is essentially because of the greenhouse warming. It's like having a blanket. Even though your body temperature is only 98 or whatever, once you have a blanket, you can actually sweat because you trap all that energy and you warm yourself up. That's the purpose of the blanket. But 
So you have energy going out. Essentially, you have to basically balance 340 minus 100 to what is going out, so that is okay. But internally, you can bounce around the energy and create much higher numbers, right? So global warming calculations are all about trying to figure out where the energy is going um, and how long it's staying. So you can immediately imagine that land gets warmed much faster than ocean. Why? Huh? Right? Heat capacity plus ocean is deep, so it can keep the energy for a long time. Ninety, more than ninety percent of the energy is going into the ocean, right? And if it decides one day to say, I'm tired and I'm going to belch it out, then we all have to move to Mars. It will be so warm, right? So that is not, the details are not included here. This is some kind of a long-term average. But when you actually do global warming and try to understand how the energy imbalance is happening, you have to actually understand how the energy is getting moved around in the system because you have to go back to the other figure we saw before. Why is it that? CO2 and methane are increasing, but the temperature is not increasing yet. So these have increased, but this is not increasing as rapidly yet. Because energy is going into the ocean, it's going into melting glaciers, it's going into evaporating the ocean, and so on and so forth. Right? So in fact, even if you stopped emitting carbon dioxide and methane right here and do not increase them anymore, that energy is already in the system. It's in the ocean somewhere. So this will eventually warm up. Okay? So in fact, that is called committed warming. I'm just going to throw out that phrase right now, but we'll come back to it later. This lecture I'm going to use just to introduce all the broader concept, but we'll keep on coming back to the details. So if you didn't, don't come back tomorrow, then you will have gotten most of the stuff. How many are not coming back tomorrow? Avantika is not coming back. She already knows everything. No? Okay. So it is called committed warming because by putting up this much CO2 and methane into the atmosphere, we are already committed to some warming. Even if we prevent, unless we take it out and put it somewhere, hide it somewhere, we have already put out this much energy into the system, so this warming will continue. Okay. Is that clear? I think I'm going to go one and a half hours each day. Uh, but how many of you are tired already? We can take a... You can all stand up and stretch if you want. No? Yes? Are they affected? They are, Avantika says. Avantika has already read Times of India every day. We will see that ocean is warming and it has warmed. So other thing to remember, because its heat capacity and density are high, 0.1 degree warming of the ocean, if you look at how much energy that is, it is and more than the energy we use for the whole world in the one year. So there is a lot of uh, warming that has already happened. So this is just to show you that it's not just that there is greenhouse gas, so there is uh, more energy being trapped, so everything is warming up, which means more energy is staying in the system and so on. It is essentially true, but what is happening also is that the level from which the energy gets reflected to space also changes. So essentially you are emission temperature changes. So the energy balance is changing, but it's equilibrating at a newer temperature. But obviously in a fast time scale like this, where you are constantly changing greenhouse gas effect, you haven't reached equilibrium yet. So that's what committed warming would mean. If you stopped emitting, so this is essentially saying that the atmospheric structure itself will change and the energy from where uh, emission happens uh, is also changing, which has an impact because that temperature gradient will come back to decides how stable the atmosphere is, which means 
how much it will rain, where it will rain, etc., etc. So essentially, quite a complicated thing. So you cannot do all this without worrying about carbon dioxide. And this is just showing a very quick uh, carbon cycle kind of figure, which also gives you a sense of how different the time scales are. You can think of it as an Earth system uh, where you are including chemistry, physics, water, uh, energy, geochemistry, and so on. Everybody has a sense of what a system is, right? What is a system? Many of these things are intuitively obvious, but if grandma asks what is a system, then you have to be very quick in answering it properly. What would be a proper answer? So that grandma is not disappointed on the money she spent on you. Huh? Somebody is saying something? What is a system? It's like a Telugu movie dialogue. You realize, like, you use these words so easily, but you never thought about what it means. It is components of different things working together to make. So the joke is, what is the difference between a dead cat and a live cat? A dead cat is dead, it's not breathing. Then all systems are shut down. Live cat, as long as it's breathing, it may be blind, deaf, paralyzed, hips broken, whatever, but it's still functioning, right? So you can think also as your own body. You have skeletal system, digestive system, neural system, etc. They are all working together. But it's essentially components moving together, not necessarily always in equilibrium, but they amount to some function. There is a functionality of a system. You do, I mean, you're supposed to be learning, but maybe you're not, but that's kind of function of the system today. How many of you are learning? Okay, so this is basically showing the greenhouse effects and poles to equator. You have warming, heating, evaporation, photosynthesis. We'll see what upwelling means. CO2 is moving at very different time scales. So geologic and tectonic time scales are on millions of years, uh, whereas you have volcanoes which suddenly put out lots of uh, greenhouse gases, for example, dust and sulfur and so on. Precipitation can happen in minutes to hours to days, and evaporation is a slow process, and so on, river runoff, etc., etc. So Earth is a system that has the hydrologic system, the circulation system, the heat system, uh, the CO2 system, and so on. And we will see that on a very long time scale, there are processes that are controlling CO2, like weathering, for example. When rain happens, CO2 in the uh, atmosphere easily dissolves into it, becomes H2CO3, which falls on rocks and weathers it, which means it mel melts the silicates and cal calcium carbonates, puts it into the ocean. The photosynthesis also puts some CO2, which gets metamorphized or sediment compression into rocks, eventually gets put back into the atmosphere via volcanoes and so on. So on very various time scales, all these processes end up becoming important. For example, if you covered the entire Earth with ice, volcanoes will not be covered. So CO2 will begin to build up in the atmosphere because it cannot go into the ocean. So eventually you will warm the temperatures and the ice will begin to melt. So that happens on a very long time scale. But right now on a very fast time scale, when we put, uh, when volcanic eruptions happen, if it is very high uh, ash content or aerosol content, and if it's put in the stratosphere, we'll see why stratosphere things can stay for a long time. Then you can actually cool down global temperatures by a fraction of a degree over several years. And you can go back in the past, 1896, 1816, and so on, find things like uh, year without summer and so on, where the volcanic eruptions cooled the temperatures, killed all the crops, created good art like, how many of you know Edvard Munch's uh, painting called The Scream? So you can Google these things and it's basically 
very uh, brightly colored sky with a horror face and whatever that is related to volcanic eruption. Even horror novels like Frankenstein and uh, uh, Dracula and so on came out of the summer, uh, year without summer and so on. So there is impacts on very short time scales and impact on very long time scales. All these processes uh, play into uh, the uh, uh, energy balance and where you are at any given time. So we will come back to it later, but essentially now we don't do just climate models. We do what are called Earth system models. So we include not only the uh, atmospheric circulation and ocean circulation and uh, land, soil moisture, etc., but we also include vegetation and photosynthesis and even sometimes humans and so on. Okay, that's the point of the Earth system. So, what are the, the feedbacks? So, you, you can think of feedback, maybe this is a good time to introduce it and then we can see if there are questions. So, you can think of, uh, let's say, uh, electric blanket. So, you have the temperature of the body and let's say temperature of the blanket. What is the purpose of the electric blanket? If you are cold, then you want to increase the temperature of the blanket to get warm. So that is, uh, let's say, a negative feedback, right? Because if this is cold, this will get warm. If this gets too warm, then you want to reduce it. So that is also a negative feedback. Too warm, you want to make it colder. So this blanket is got two negative feedbacks. If you multiply them, there is a net positive feedback. And this is a like a thermostat. You set the AC on a thermostat so that if temperature falls below the temperature, uh, setting temperature, it will begin to, it will close down, right? If it gets warmer than that, then the AC will turn on. So negative feedback systems are like thermostats, they are stable, okay? Whereas positive feedbacks like the ice albedo feedback we saw, that is a runaway system where if temperature cools down, then glaciers begin to build, more snow falls because it's colder, and more glacier will grow. It will keep going till some other thing breaks this cycle. And the same way, the warming. If you begin to warm like we are doing now, Greenland glacier has begun to melt, which means its albedo is reducing and it's absorbing, oh, so the system is absorbing more energy and the melting will increase, warming will increase and so on. So th those are positive feedbacks. So positive feedbacks are unstable, but in general, you don't have always uh, whole system working as a positive or negative because as glaciers begin to melt, maybe there is more humidity in the air, more clouds, clouds can reflect sunlight and so on. But if you continue to increase the temperature, obviously Greenland will melt eventually. Okay, that's the point of the feedback. So you have to know all the feedbacks that are there in the system. When you build a model, you don't necessarily have to put in each feedback. If you have the processes represented, then the feedback should be there already because of the equations you have used. And all the feedbacks happen and you get what are solutions that are called emergent solutions as opposed to convergent solutions. So when you do closed systems, you often build for convergence. So you have convergent solutions and in fact you look for convergence if it doesn't converge you'll be worried about it like let's say i don't know rama and amit must be working on a lot of convergent systems whereas in an open system like this you often have what are called emergent solutions so you don't know what is going to happen so you'll get a solution that essentially you didn't expect okay so we have here on one side what are called causes or external forcing. Anything that is affecting the radiative balance, like humans with their fossil fuel burning, or the volcano that affects the energy balance, what is called radiative forcing, we call them external forcing. 
So you have changes in plate tectonics. So if you took away the Himalayas, for example, you would change the circulation, you would do many things. Uh, Earth's orbit, we will see that if you change the ellipticity of the orbit, the obliquity or the precession, you will change the radiation balance. Or sunspots and the amount of energy coming in, we'll see that sun has been growing constantly in luminosity, it was 30% uh, less luminous when the system got formed, um, but also there are sunspots, 11-year uh, cycle and so on and so forth. All those are external forcings and in fact, most people put humans here as well and volcanoes and so on and so forth, okay? So within the climate system, you have the atmosphere, the ocean, the land, vegetation and ice. We haven't, there is chemistry in here, but we haven't shown explicitly. So if you change vegetation, you change albedo, you change evapotranspiration, so you change atmospheric circulation, you would also affect soil moisture and land heat capacity and albedo. So there is that feedback. If you change land, you change runoff, you change uh, amount of chemicals coming into the ocean and so on. So there is that feedback. If you change ocean temperatures, you will change the amount of ice and so on. So there is feedback between everybody and everybody. And the net outcome is that you, you will have changes in um, atmosphere, changes in ice and so on and so forth. The critical phrase here, external forcing and internal responses, which means they don't, uh, they are not necessarily uh, related to external forcing. So, if you think of human beings as external forcings, even if human beings didn't do any greenhouse gas changes, you would have the monsoon, you would have things like El Nino. How many of you have heard of El Nino? I don't think I'm not sure. Varanasi, there is no El Nino. So we'll see what El Nino is. These are called internal modes or internal variabilities. Why is this important? Because if you remember, we showed a change in temperature over Chennai, let's say since 1882 to 2014, whatever, there was a warming of 0.8 degrees centigrade. If tomorrow Modi asks you, is this really caused by humans? you should have a quantitative way of saying this is not internal variability. This is not caused by changes in solar forcing or the energy coming in and the feedbacks happening in the system or Earth's orbit or plate tectonics and so on. So the, exter the internal variability is or internal response is because of all these feedbacks that happen because of natural changes. Only human beings are now considered an external forcing that is causing change that is not internal response, okay? So we'll look at internal variability and what is called anthropogenic change. Everybody know, heard the term anthropogenic? Hmm? Yes, no? So anthropogenic. So anthropogenic change is what we look for. So we should always have a way of saying when you detect a change, let's say in temperature, amount of rainfall, uh, the kind of rainfall, uh, number of rainy days, whatever change, coastal temperature, um, amount of fish you can catch. So there is a signal you detect and it is called attribution where you can separate the internal response or the internal variability and say, this can be attributed to human influence. This is the critical part now that you will read every day in the newspaper something happened and that's climate change. Somebody went from Varanasi to ICTS, climate change. But that is a detection, not necessarily attribution. So attribution is where you are able to separate natural variability from internal variability, okay? So maybe I should stop here and see if there are any more questions. What we can do is, hopefully they have not given me any task for the afternoons. Then after my nap, I can meet 
I take a nap because I'm now 86 years old. From 3 to 4 every day, anybody who wants to discuss anything can come with a bottle of wine. Is it allowed? <laughs> and we can discuss questions. Are there any questions? Yes. What is your name? Shavya, from where? Bangalore, okay. Yeah, so we will we'll see that in the future lectures. Detection and attribution, I said, so you measure a change, then are we able to attribute to that, that to human impact or whatever? So we'll see, there are some methods. You can also look up a website called ACE, uh, Attribution of Climate Effects or something like Climate Events, sorry, Attribution of Climate Events where when a big flood like Kerala happens, they, people sit there and try to separate, try to say whether the probability of that event was increased by climate change. Okay? So you cannot always say, yes, that happened because of climate change, but there are ways to say, it was, let's say, it happened before in 1924. It happened now almost 100 years later. So there are things like return periods. What climate change will do is it will make a 100-year event appear every 50 years or every 20 years. So you have to show that the probability of the event was changed by climate change. And there are many other things, but these kind of things is what we have to do. All these things are kind of buzzwords in the system, but that's basically Paleocene. So the, those are geologic periods. That's the Paleocene, Eocene, thermal maximum. Okay, but if you tell if you tell Grandma, I know what PETM is. Obviously, she'll be impressed. Right? It's all about. Why do I keep saying grandma? Because the idea is you should be able to explain climate change to anybody. A lot of people who think climate change is not happening, which is okay, but it's like saying, anyway, I won't go in there. I mean, when you solve something like Navier-Stokes equation and like a, a flow around a airfoil or something, you set up your equations and you look for convergence. So it could be heat transfer problem, it could be flow in a tank or whatever. But when you have an open system like Earth system, which is getting energy from outside, moving energy out, it's feedbacks in the system. You can look at every day's climate for the last 65 million years, but it doesn't necessarily include the entire solution the phase space. So when you run the model with all these nonlinear feedbacks, you might find a solution that has never occurred before. Now, those are usually called emergent solutions. Okay. So this is a very nonlinear system, so it has potentially emergent solutions. It has emergent solutions. Okay. Yes. Yes. That one, only if you come back next week. <laughs> this is a first lecture. That was, all this was used to introduce the concepts. We will go back. So, the, the lectures are about Tectonic time scales, orbital time scales, glacial, deglacial time scales, millennial, historic, modern, future. So, we'll explain. You are not coming back tomorrow.
Huh? You needed an incentive. I'm not even getting paid. <laughs> Any other question? What time is lunch? Oh, we have plenty of time. So anyway, this is kind of a, this kind of pace is okay. I don't know how much we will cover at this pace, but I'm okay with it. If, if the goal is to understand along the way everything and not think you will understand it later. So if it is too slow, like for Avantika, then we can go faster. Whose feeling is this too slow? Too slow or too fast? No. You look at the syllabus, it is, in, it is under data archives. There is a lecture which quickly will explain how we use, what methods we use to infer past temperatures or circulation and so on. The, the, the slide had something called delta O18, and I said oxygen isotopes, right? So you, there are isotopes which uh, respond to temperature change uh, and so on. And if we have some evidence of that isotope from that time, we can compare to the present time and infer the change in temperature. Those are called, yeah. So it's good to know these words, but again, as, as I said, if you know what system is and you don't know what, me what it means, you might say carbon dating, but then grandma asks, what is carbon dating? Hmm? You can try it. <laughs> they are called paleo proxies. They are proxies because we are saying temperature, but actually they are not directly measuring temperature. They are a proxy for temperature. Okay. So paleo means past, paleo climate. Paleo proxies. So we'll quickly go through some paleo proxies, which range from isotopes, tree rings, corals, ocean sediments, ice cores, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's only three-week course, so you won't get everything answered, but you can get enough that you can go and read up particular things if you are interested. <clears throat> 